an analysis of how much of that capacity is used per class, per link. If the utilization meets or within standards, you, you can consider yourself to be done. If they're not, the objective is the, the uh, process is to go back and change one or more of those top items. You can change the topology, for example, uh, adding capacity or adding express links um, or changing the, changing the topology altogether. You can change the routing policy. You can change um, the QoS settings. Uh, and if you're lucky, you can change your traffic matrix, which, but that <laughs> tends to be harder to do. Okay? And that fits within this overall process. Um, that if you're going through it step by step. There's a section that has to do, step one, uh, with, with getting the traffic. Step two, uh, working through what are acceptable utilization thresholds. Step three is the part that's where you take the topology and those other two inputs and do the analysis. Um, and of course, you may choose to do various optimizations either in the routing, which is in step four, or step five where you're augmenting the capacity or the topology. Okay. So far, so good. Let's move on to where does the topology come from? If you remember, uh, Clarence had listed four sources of input. So for the topology, for the basic infrastructure, the main three sources of information are listed up here. Uh, extremely easy to get at is uh, the ISIS or the OSPF database, the IGP database. It's cheap. You go to one router, you can get yourself a full connectivity. L3 connectivity, it's wonderful. It doesn't give you a lot of information. It doesn't, often doesn't give you capacities and things like that, but you know, with, with that you can just get started pretty well. Most common source of uh, information for long-term capacity planning uh, tends to be configuration files. The configuration files do give you a heck of a lot of information except that they give you a view of the network as it is designed, not necessarily as it's operational now. And as you'll see in future slides, there is a lot of give and take between the planning process, the engineering process, the routing process, and uh, operational work. And you really need the two different uh, views of the network, both how the network is designed and how it's operational at any given point. For the network as it's operating, of course, SNMP and show commands are the way to go. Okay. For anybody here you know, who wants to be embarking on uh, uh, doing the data gathering or doing, working these things, the IGP topology and interface counters are quite easy to get at and uh, I, most organizations should be able to get at those relatively quickly. If you have RSVP in the network or LDP in the network, that becomes harder and also we'll go through a little bit of that as well. Same with multicasting QS. Some of the major challenges that we're dealing with right now have to do with uh, port channel mappings. It's difficult. It's not difficult to discover individual ports, but it's difficult to map which ports are together and which ones are the ones that, are, that will be failing together. Um, it is difficult to get at the optical topology just because the uh, optical equipment uh, don't have very good automated discovery uh, procedures. And furthermore, it's a very difficult and a hassle to map uh, how a wavelength maps to a particular uh, L3 circuit. A lot of folks we know tend to put uh, in the description fields, would put the, the description of the circuit in the optical side or vice versa to make that happen. Again, those sorts of things fall outside of things that you can say as part of a best practice. Uh, I have a tool that does it. It really has to be done a best practice within, within the organization. Uh, physical infrastructure, even harder. Uh, where is it in the particular building, what floor it's in, which particular um, ducts is it going through. Um, another bit, uh, uh, source of information that's challenging for us that's coming up is IPv6. Um, it's not hard to discover IPv6 topology, but there are hardly any IPv6 counters, differentiated counters between IPv4 for traffic and IPv6 traffic that exist. So if you want to be doing IPv6 planning apart from IPv4, it is difficult to do, keep that in mind. Um, we find some of the challenges being in multi-domain services. You know, we have uh, uh, folks providing mobile um, backhaul circuits that start in a region, go through a backbone, and go to a, a third region, where if you want to be providing SLAs for that whole 
um, layer two circuit, you have to have a notion of all the topology and all the planning processes that take place across those three, kind of being able to stitch those elements together. Uh, I don't know anybody in this room, but I'm pretty confident nobody has multi-topology routing implemented. It's relatively new, um, but that is very, very difficult. L2 infrastructure similarly. And last but not least, there are elements outside of the uh, IGP layer three that affect the planning process. Um, many of you are affected by how the CDNs shift their traffic huge amounts um, at, at will, it seems, <laughs> and often. Um, and those are challenges in capacity planning that uh, we can also discuss here as well. But I won't be net immediately. Okay. So the, what we'll be going through here mostly will be the left-hand side. Um, how do you get at the, uh, the information and what do you do with it? And, and what, what are the considerations to have? Um, for the routing policy itself, uh, again, Clarence has divided it up into um, a, how you, one would get at the uh, uh, routing under normal conditions versus routing under failures, backup paths. And what he's trying to highlight in this particular slide is the fact that, again, life is very easy with ISIS, uh, with, with a simple IGP. Uh, the shortest path first algorithms are easy to simulate. Um, it's, you know, we, we already talked about how easy it is to get the, get the information. But if you have MPLST, especially dynamic MPLST, where the tunnels have bandwidth and the, uh, uh, and the links have uh, reservation amounts, it becomes, your planning process becomes more difficult because it becomes difficult to uh, predict what the actual tunnels are doing. Okay? And uh, it's not deterministic It all depends on the order in which the tunnels get established. So there are some examples of this near the end, but that's something to keep in mind. The sort of uh, planning process that works for uh, simple IGP or static MPLS uh, will not work for dynamic MPLST. Um, last but not least, in this audience, I don't believe uh, static MPLSTEs where uh, primary and secondary paths are provisioned ahead of time is very popular. Is that true? Anybody in this audience? Look at one. It's, it's a lot more prevalent amongst folks who've moved from an ATM network where this is the way of running the network. Um, again, Planning process is very nice and easy for uh, when one has static MPLST tunnels. It just becomes more, because you, you, you set it up, it's relatively predictable. Um, you pay the price on the operational side. You know, you have 100 uh, nodes. Uh, that means almost 10,000 tunnels that you have to actively manage. Okay? So as, as Clarence says, there's really no free lunch in there. Um, secondary multicast and BGP, again, there are uh, uh, tools like ours. Dave Wang is here from Wandel, uh, and also um, share tools that do help in collecting this sort of information. In terms of the effect of their uh, uh, routing policy for backup paths on the planning process, as you can see here, uh, the, the ISIS remains simple. Um, Clarence had put in a few slides on loop-free alternates uh, uh, or IP fast reroute, which is an interesting, uh, relatively new technology for um, having alternate backups available that's very uh, easy to put in. And uh, uh, it does not complicate the analysis too much. So we'll go uh, across that a bit. Uh, but for the same reason that figuring out the network behavior under normal conditions was difficult with dynamic uh, MPLS, the uh, under failure, it's doubly more difficult uh, with dynamic MPLS. Um, there are considerations with fast reroute and also uh, the various versions of fast reroute. Uh, who, who in this room has fast reroute implemented? One. Okay. All right. So I think we will skip much of that as well. If that's okay. Now, in terms of QoS, QoS itself is a complicated topic, but QS policies from a planning perspective do not have to be complicated. Um, in general, what we find is that the uh, 
it is possible and desirable uh, to come up with uh, network-wide uh, bandwidth allocation policies, uh, and there will be an example of this later on, where one takes uh, the services that one is offering and maps them to um, relatively few uh, uh, QS policies that may have different instantiations in the edge of the network versus the core of the network. But again, it's, it's a policy that one sets up and one can set up uh, pretty much once, and uh, that remains stable over time. So there's, uh, we're not going to make a big uh, deal about uh, automated um, uh, doing a lot of manipulations of the QS policy. Uh, we're not going to be changing those very much as part of uh, the, this presentation of uh, going about capacity planning. The most important um, section of, uh, of, of the policy, especially with QS, is basically how much headroom do you need to set aside in order to meet your SLAs. Okay? And this, was, uh, this, this particular topic was under a lot of um, discussion and, and research, especially 10 years ago, where there was a lot of disagreement in how much, how much headroom do you need? Do you need a lot of active management of flows in order to meet your SLAs? Or can you just say, look, as long as I'm below 80%, everything is okay? I think the consensus, um, both in terms of research and practice, has been that as long as the uh, link capacity is less than 80 to 90% for large links, services do okay. Um, is there anyone who disagrees with that at this point? I, mean, I realize there are services, uh, you know, some military applications and some video applications where even a single drop cannot be tolerated, where you don't want to lose an iframe or the like. But generally, for most of the services uh, for operators within Nanog, 80 to 90 percent seems to do okay. okay. Well, this, this used to cause a lot of... Uh, uh, fights at some point. Um, but, you know, again, we've found both uh, for folks who've been studying it from a theoretical perspective, um, you see it, the, the top chart there, it shows, um, uh, it shows uh, uh, utilization on the y-axis and how much capacity is required in order to have uh, one out of a thousand packets uh, uh, only one out of a thousand packets have a uh, uh, more than two milliseconds delay in, in getting through the queue. And as you can, and it's very difficult to see, but the curve of it is uh, around 80, around 90 percent. And that's, I believe, for a two gigabyte link. I'm not sure, but in the lower plot, you can see it that uh, all the the three the three um, lines that are at the bottom, the knee of the plot. Um, is around 85 percent, and that uh, that's one one gig link. As, sorry, uh, OC12 one gig, and OC48 links at the bottom. Okay, so the bottom one is based on uh, actual packet captures simulated through a queue, and the top one is a theoretical analysis. Okay. So, basically, again, as long as the uh, headroom that you're setting aside, you know, under failure, under your, your uh, failure policies, what you want to be looking at is uh, around 10, 20 percent. The services will not get affected. You don't need fancy um, flow management schemes to keep the services going. Okay. So that might beg the question, so what's the role of uh, quality of service in this? You know, if, if you're going to keep everything below 80 to 90 percent and if you're going to plan for it, why even bother um, with any uh, class of service or QoS um, changes? And Clarence here has put a, a nice example. Um, and my summary of that example is that it's basically insurance. If you have a class of service that is um, either highly sensitive or highly profitable, uh, it is nice insurance to put it in a class of its own. So an example he has is that the first class has only uh, two gigabits of traffic, and there's another class of eight gigabits of traffic, and the queues are set up that the first class can use up up to 90% of 
um, of, of uh, that Q can use up 90% of the capacity. And the second class uh, can use whatever is left over and just has 10% that is um, uh, set aside for it. So in effect, what you get yourself is only uh, uh, two out of the nine is used up for the first class and you have yourself you know, 75, 85% headroom. And that basically allows for all sorts of unexpected things that happen. You know, you might be planning for um, one train to derail, uh, but now you can have one train derail and have a flood at the same time elsewhere, and this, this service would, would remain effective. Okay. It basically just, just makes lighter, And this is perfectly reasonable, especially if the class two has uh, looser uh, uh, SLA requirements. Uh, the two references here, uh, uh, one from Clarence uh, and another one in the book that they have, go through a very uh, uh, detailed descriptions of how to actually configure um, the queue settings for this sort of a setup. And I won't uh, go into details on those. Okay. So let me stop here with the first section. I think this is the most difficult for me since Clarence had done this. Uh, the rest of them will be easier. Um, any questions for Clarence? Dump, dump, dump. All right, let's move on to traffic matrix. This is, this is my bread and butter. <laughs> easier. So what is a traffic matrix? Um, as part of the capacity planning, for, you know, you, you're going to have, you're, you're trying to move traffic around, right? A traffic or a demand matrix is the notion of uh, the load you're going to be putting on the network. And that's different depending on the application. Um, if you're running, uh, you know, mostly uh, layer two services and uh, um, voice traffic and things like that, you can do just fine. You can do complete a lot of planning barely uh, just using core router to core router traffic matrices. Okay because your traffic doesn't shift very much from the outside ASs, and you can do simple planning from your uh, ARs to the core routers. You know, you don't need to do simulations. You can just watch for them to go um, above 50% and upgrade at, at will. But for the cases where the, the planning process matters, that's the core to core, um, all you need is core to core traffic matrix. Now, as the edges become more complicated, you might want to have AR to AR traffic matrices. Um, on, the, on the far end, uh, if you're doing strategic planning, long-term planning, five-year out planning, it almost doesn't matter to have core router to core router traffic. Pop to pop traffic is just fine because those routers are not gonna be there five years from now anyway. <laughs> and if I were to say one thing about uh, best practice in capacity planning, Start with as simple as possible. If you are really doing strategic long-term planning, just keep it to pop to pop. It's a lot more stable than router to router, any router to router traffic, and a lot more easily obtainable. And only go to CR to CR or AR to AR traffic matrices as needed. If you have, uh, if you're running a network where you're getting a lot of tra uh, traffic from the outside, if you have, you know, multiple transit providers, or um, very big or uh, 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 a lot of CDN traffic that shifts across your endpoints of the network. At that point, you want an external traffic matrix. That's the, uh, not just from your, core, your routers to your routers, but from your routers to external ASs and possibly from external ASs to other external ASs. Um, at that point, you really need NetFlow, which Paolo will be talking about, and you really increased the overhead and the amount of work and modeling you have to do uh, one notch higher. That's worth keeping in mind. Now, how do you actually measure uh, the traffic matrix? If you were to measuring the traffic matrix itself, um, the, the, the two common ways would be using flows or LSP information, LSP statistics. Um, this a section of the slides is, is also Clarence's slides, but I've modified them, uh, and you'll see why in a second. Uh, Paolo will be talking about uh, NetFlow quite a bit, and uh, uh, there's V5, V9 that we'll, we'll describe. I mean, we find that the flow statistics 
can be quite inaccurate at any given point in time, especially depending on the equipment you have, um, but are very, very useful, as you will see in a second later. For core-to-core -core traffic, um, if you have any LDP enabled uh, for your VPN services or the like, those statistics are great. Um, it's a lot of things to measure, and you must take account of uh, uh, missing values. Routers just decide not to respond, and you have to keep in mind that some router vendors uh, only report how much traffic is transiting through a particular um, LDP tunnel, not just starting. But given all those caveats, it's a wonderful source of information, and one can uh, get a good internal traffic matrix for it. Unfortunately, keep in mind, it's not per class, and uh, there are a lot of little hassles one has to deal with. If you've gone through the process of the hassle of putting RSVP in the network, great. They've got good measurement. You can, you can get those. And uh, there are some people who have even gone through the trouble of putting in uh, a full RSVP mesh with zero bandwidth so it doesn't change the routing just to get their traffic matrices. And they can get uh, router, to router, tra router to router traffic matrices. And even if they're a little bit odd, they get added up at a pop to pop level, they're perfect. Okay. So the slides that I got from Clarence said V9 is the way to go. And that was pretty much his, his conclusion and, um, and description. Now, for me, uh, I'd say it's, it's quite different. You know, uh, somebody like Clarence who works at a router vendor, uh, we're both standing in the same place looking at the same networks, but he's looking forward. Right? He's not looking at, uh, like me, he's not looking at what's actually in the network now. You know, I, I have to deal with 7,600 SUP1 cards. He's looking at, you know, this network could have ASR 99 millions in it. You know, this, the, all these things that we've done in the last two, three years, all these things that we're going to do. So, yes, if you're looking into the future, V9 may be the way to go. But if you have a real network today that's still got equipment that you bought five years ago, hasn't quite been depreciated, you really cannot. You have to be flexible. You have to be able to live with what you have. Um, the other element of it, I think, that, that gives uh, uh, someone like Clarence a, a slightly different vision is that when they go into a network, they, they do these sorts of design analyses you know, as, as one-offs. They have a bunch of smart people who come in and, or work with the uh, engineers there. They, they work around issues. They work around troubles. They work around um, uh, missing values, whatnot. They, they do all those things. Um, but in my case, we're installing systems that have to stay after the engineer who was doing this gets bored and leaves. These things must be automated and live day to day and work uh, day in, day out without a lot of hassle and without somebody uh, watching over them. And I think last but not least, uh, I've just been beaten into submission. You know, it's very difficult. If you've worked with in any service provider within any IT organization, it's very difficult to get things changed. You really have to live within the system. Um, there's all sorts of good things that one can do, but most of them uh, will not be allowed by IT in the next 12 months. So my recommendation, again, which is slightly different um, uh, from Clarence's, is that you know, start with the direct measurements. If it works, if all the processes are there, great. You're, you're wonderful, you're done. But move towards a system um, where you can use link standards as a gold standard, and I'll talk through an estimation uh, regression procedure from there, and add in additional information, be it NetFlow, MPLS, or whatever, LDP, whatever additional measurements that you have uh, over time, and, and only as needed. Okay. Slide is slightly out of order, um, so I really should be describing what I mean by demand estimation. So again, let me, let me re go through it again. Do direct measurement. If it works, great. You're done. Stop. If, if you want to do something more, the next simplest thing to do would be to do a demand estimation, which is sometimes called tomogravity by the at and Labs folk. It's got different names uh, depending on whose papers you're reading. 
And the demand estimation procedure is as follows. It says that you want to get an idea of how much traffic is going from router to router, let's say from A to C and A to B. But in effect, the only measurements you can make are link measurements. And imagine in this case, you're only making that link measurement between uh, the two core routers, six megabits a second. Uh, the question is, how can you solve for A and B, for the, the traffic from A to B and the traffic from A to C, if you only have the six megabits measurement? And there, uh, you can get an answer through solving um, that funny little linear equation at the bottom. This, this is a good two-hour presentation that we've given before at Nanog, um, and I won't go through any details. But you can get yourself an estimate. You don't really have a notion of how much A to B is versus how much A to C is, but you know that the sum of them together is uh, six megabits a second. And what you get yourself uh, is, is uh, summarized here on the left-hand side. This plot you see has known demands on the uh, x-axis and the estimated demands through the, the estimation procedure on the y-axis. What you get yourself are answers that are way off. If, everything, if, if you had estimated the demands, the AB and the BC correctly, and if you had been able to distinguish between them, all those blue dots would have come across on that 45-degree uh, line. Okay? The numbers would have matched. Uh, and as you can see, they don't match. There's uh, ones way out here where the known demand is considerably larger um, than what was estimated. Okay, so it was estimated here. It should have been more up here at the estimate. Uh, or vice versa, the known demand is, uh, the estimate was much higher than, the, than what you actually know to be there. But what's amazing is that for the purposes of failure analysis, just for those purposes, if you take the estimated demands that are wrong and you do failure analysis on them, you get pretty good results. And that's summarized on this uh, right-hand plot. So the right-hand plot is failure worst-case link utilizations um, using the, the known traffic matrix on the x-axis, and on the y-axis is using the estimated ones. And those come together very, very well. And this paradox is explained by the fact that even though you can't tell uh, the A and Bs have been changed, uh, Oakland to Baltimore versus Palo Alto to, to um, Dallas, even though you can't tell them apart, when there's a failure between the San Jose and, and Dallas link, both of those demands reroute together through Chicago. Okay? And that's the crucial insight. You can actually do pretty good failure planning based on link stat measurements. I wouldn't use the demands that come out of that for uh, growth planning. I wouldn't say, well, you know, uh, I really believe uh, I know how much goes from Oakland to Baltimore, and, you know, I know that's going to change by this amount. I wouldn't use it for any of those purposes. I certainly wouldn't use it for billing. <laughs> but for failure analysis, that's going to get you someplace. The role of NetFlow LSP stats and all of those is that with relatively few of those measurements, you can bring in the known demands. Okay? You don't need to have full measurement if you have a regression estimation procedure on top of that. Um, in this case, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, about you know, 10 very well-placed measurements did the trick. Um, but if you can put yourself in a position where uh, you can co collect NetFlow on a few large, well-placed routers. That's wonderful. If you can get yourself uh, just some RSVP measurements, that's wonderful. If you can do LDP but can't do it very often, that's just enough. Again, keep in mind that interface counters really remain the most relevant and relevant statistics. All our planning procedures are based on link stats, be they uh, five-minute, two-minute, whatever those link stats. And you want to use that as the gold standard. All the other sources of information need to be rolled in as a way of getting better estimates in there. And, you know, one of the examples, um, just to make that concrete, uh, you know, in one deployment, we have uh, topology discovery done in near real time, and it's keeping up uh, with the events of the network. The LDP measurements are done, you know, every hour. 
and even that's pushing it. You know, we, we could have done just just as well with every four-hour measurements. Not very often. It's it's a lot of load and strain on the routers. You just don't have to do it that often. You collect the interface measurements every two minutes, but then using the mathematical procedure, you can combine the two informations and get yourself pretty robust traffic matrices that are available on a five-minute by five-minute basis. Okay. Um, I would actually stop right now and uh, pass over to Paolo, unless there are any questions about either to, uh, topology discovery or uh, traffic. Okay, if not, I pass it to Paolo. Hello, um, this is uh, Paolo Lucente. As uh, Harman said before, I'm a principal uh, software developer at the PMSCT project, which uh, we will be seeing a little bit in uh, the next uh, few slides. And uh, today I'm contributing some 10, 11 slides, so I hope you don't really uh, mind uh, some 15 minutes or of Italian English. Uh, so be patient. Um, so uh, what is the PMSCT project? Uh, first of all, it is uh, open source uh, free GPL uh, software initiative. And it is an IPv4, IPv6 uh, accounting package. Um, how, can you, how you might see on this slide, so on the left-hand side, you have some traffic collection methods, so leap, pickup, netflow, sflow, or ulog. Of course, uh, uh, IPfix is missing, but IPfix is there um, as well. And uh, uh, on the other side of the PMSCT, you see uh, some very known, um, you know, some backends, so very known uh, open source relational databases, some like uh, MySQL, Postgre, and SQLite, but also memory tables. Um, PMSCT can act as a NetFlow or SFlow, let's say, collector, uh, but the fact that you see also NetFlow and SFlow on the right hand side of the slide, it means that it can act also as a probe, but that's really out of uh, discussion today. Um, now, in saying this, uh, PMSCT doesn't just stay in the middle and writes to a database what is read from the network, right? So it doesn't want to be just uh, another copy of flow tools or things like that. Uh, it really uh, allows you to do some um, aggregation, so spatial and temporal aggregation, and also spatial and temporal grouping, which is something that we will see uh, later on. And it also allows you to do some uh, lookups uh, based on some maps, but also very relevant to this presentation, lookups uh, against the BGP. So, um, and of course you can check it out right away to the URL in the corner. Um, so, uh, PMSCT, what happened some time ago is that uh, PMSCT uh, was really a NetFlow as flow collector, traditional, let's say, with the features that we said, and it got uh, added or introduced by a Quagga-based BGP daemon. So you can really imagine that as uh, two threads that work uh, within the same application. One is listening for uh, NetFlow or SFlow uh, packages on one side, the other is keeping up uh, BGP sessions with your routers. And then uh, the two information, routing information and the uh, uh, telemetry information, they are uh, joined together. Of course, that if they can be joined together. Uh, what is the ba uh, basic idea how to join uh, telemetry information with routing information uh, is to, um, you know, see for the telemetry uh, IP address, so the, the, the agent IP address, in the case of NetFlow, the source IP address, or in case of SFlow, the agent ID, and match it against the BGP source address or the router ID. So a few features of, the, uh, of this um, implementation is that, um, uh, one, uh, as I said, is uh, yeah, that it's a parallel uh, thread within a collector. The other very important is that uh, 
this information is never used to compute any uh, best path uh, route uh, or anything like that. So uh, every route collected from the router is uh, maintained uh, separated. So you, uh, you end up with per peer BGP RIPs. And that is very important because uh, at, the, at the end you offload a lot of uh, calculations from the collector, which is, let's say, a central point, and you rely a lot on the best path calculation done by the routers themselves. And so why BGP at the collector and uh, why I ask this question uh, is that, uh, of course, the trend that I see, especially uh, within uh, uh, the router vendors, uh, Cisco, for example, is that especially on the uh, software platforms, uh, they are uh, trying to encapsulate into the uh, telemetry protocol, so into the NetFlow, as much information as possible. So what I expect uh, happening in the near future is that also a lot of BGP information which are not there yet today, uh, they will be there, um, right? So, so what is my idea on that? I uh, don't know if uh, there is any disagreement on this, is that, uh, you know, the telemetry protocol should report on forwarding plane, and uh, it's a little bit uh, suboptimal that we have a nice protocol like BGP and the control plane information gets transferred over and over by NetFlow once again, right? So in my view, the optimal situation is that you get, you know, forwarding plane information from NetFlow, routing information from BGP, and then you join them together uh, into the collector. Um, getting specifically to the traffic engineering um, which is, and planning, which is the uh, main topic for today, uh, from a standpoint of uh, telemetry export or net flow export, for example, what I can see is two uh, main models. Uh, and of course, uh, I see two main models uh, that they can be also combined together and create so a third model if you want. So the first one, and I think the most relevant because then it drives to a strategic solution, is that uh, to uh, collect from the uh, edge routers, so the provider edge, from the provider edge routers, ingress only measurements uh, at edge interfaces, so the ones that are facing customers, peers, and the transits. And uh, from these routers also collect uh, BGP information. So at the very end you have PEs that export both for example, NetFlow information and BGP peer with the collector. What you uh, end up with this uh, solution is that you will get a traffic matrix end-to-end, -end, uh, and it will be a unique traffic matrix with, an unique, with a unique view of your traffic flows, and uh, it will be end-to-end, -end, so it means pop-to-pop uh, -pop or peer BGP peer AS to BGP peer AS or from source a uh, yes to destination a yes. And uh, um, so that's very interesting uh, to do. For example, uh, it, it gives a lot of information about your edges, but also what happens past your edges. So uh, just, you know, traffic, who is pushing traffic into you and uh, where you are delivering traffic to. And uh, it allows so for borders profiling. I've done some presentations uh, in, in the past about PMSCCT and how you can use it in the context of peering. So that's where, for example, I uh, speak in terms of borders profiling. And uh, so this information, let's say, when it's coupled with uh, IGP information or with a tool or with something that has also uh, a knowledge about the topology of the network, then you can start also to plan and simulate for failures. And so that's very interesting uh, and it drives, yeah, as I said, to a strategic solution. Then uh, you have a secondary export model, which is essentially to get a still ingress-only measurement, uh, but from P and P routers at core interfaces. So when you start doing that, you do not get a unique view of your network or of your traffic flows anymore, but you get N traffic matrices. So the beauty of this solution is that it's very basic and simple and doesn't require any routing information because it's like you are traffic, tracking the big flows uh, as they go through your network. But this is really a tactical solution, let's say. So um, the, the, the specific scenario in which I see this useful is that a problem already occurred, and then uh, you want to know why is that, why you have some uh, link filling 100%. So something already failed before. 
No, I would like to go uh, through two, uh, let's say, uh, illustrations for each uh, of the models. So you see that the first model, uh, yeah, it, uh, you, you get at the very end uh, just a single traffic matrix. So you have three flow, uh, the red, the violet, and, and yellow. And you do not really know what happens within your backbone. But uh, on the other side, you know, yeah, where tra traffic is coming from and going to. So that's... Uh, as I said, and you can build very well an end-to-end -end traffic matrices and see whether you are interested on your edge or what happens just past your edge. And just uh, um, let me uh, do a little bit digression on, uh, on this traffic matrix when, when it comes to the source peer AS, right? Because uh, when you, uh, don't know, uh, you instruct don't know, a router to uh, tell you about BGP information and then you say, I want a peer AS, of course, the source PRAS, the, the, the router, the only thing it can do is that, uh, yeah, it will tell you, based on BGP information, you know, the traffic should, should have been coming, based on uh, whatever, the, the traffic should come from this AS. Of course, that's very wrong because, uh, or it's a very bad assumption. It assumes that traffic is symmetric, so it's telling you where the traffic would route that traffic, and it assumes that traffic is coming from that AS number. But of course, uh, we all know that traffic is uh, asymmetric most of the times, and so uh, that's a wrong information. So what PMSCT allows you in order to tackle the source PRAS information is to give you a map that you can update. And essentially, the outcome of the solution uh, is that uh, you, at the very end, map AS numbers or MAC addresses to uh, interfaces. Um, AS numbers to interfaces, that's very good for uh, private peering, uh, transit, uh, customers uh, most of the times. Uh, Whereas, of course, you get a little bit of a problem when you get at public exchanges where, of course, you have uh, just one interface or one logical interface and a number of uh, BGP neighbors uh, out of that interface. So in that case, you really need uh, the MAC address uh, being part of the telemetry in order to specifically determine determining who is pumping traffic into your backbone. Now, uh, for who uh, has you know, uh, the luxury here to run S-Flow uh, on their devices? Uh, of, yeah, very good. Uh, that's uh, how many are running S-Flow, so Brocade? Uh, okay, I will not ask the other question. Uh, so. Uh, that's, uh, that's okay. So uh, who has the luxury of running S-Flow in this context? Uh, then, uh, of course, uh, it's uh, sorted out because uh, S-Flow traditionally uh, captures the uh, source uh, and destination MAC addresses for flows. Uh, the problems com come where uh, to, uh, yeah, to on the platforms that support NetFlow, uh, NetFlow benign or IP fix. The funny part there is that the protocol supports very well uh, the uh, MAC information, MAC layer information, but uh, vendors still tend not not to uh, have a widespread support for that, especially for routed traffic. So I see that appearing more and more uh, for switched traffic, uh, but for routed traffic, MAC information is, still, is something that is still a little bit missing. And there was a thread right on the Nangong mailing list, which I participated very briefly, on which I was calling vendors you know, uh, to, to move steps forward in that, uh, in that direction. And uh, this is, uh, let's say, uh, an illustration for the second uh, export model. And uh, as you can see over here, you, get, um, you do not get any more just a single traffic matrix. So for every flow, you can see at the, in the square at the bottom, uh, for every flow you get, you know, uh, N traffic matrices, and ang is directly, uh, you know, related to the number of uh, PP routers that are, you know, exporting uh, traffic flows. And, uh, uh, but uh, the beauty is that you see that, for example, the red flow is uh, touching PC, P3, P1, then it's getting out at PA. And as I said, of course, you can also match the two, um, the two sort of export models together, right? So you can um, you get the, bo the best of both worlds. Um, now, I would like to speak a little bit of scalability. Let's say scalability will be uh, the main topic of the remi uh, remaining uh, slides. Um, of course, uh, uh, this is uh, broken down in a few areas. So I will start with the BGP uh, scalability in this sense, and then I will move 
toward, of course, uh, you know, scalability of the backend, and then uh, finish with the traffic matrix, uh, the scalability of the traffic matrix, whether something can be done also uh, in that sense. So, uh, with the, starting with BGP peering, of course, uh, we are um, saying that, uh, yeah, uh, the BGP collect, uh, the collector should BGP peer with uh, all the PEs, but of course you might have a lot of PEs in your network, and so it's very important to determine upfront what, what would be the memory footprint required. So something like the me megabyte per peer or something like that. So PMSCT at the very beginning was employing uh, just a very simple uh, algorithm by which every uh, BGP table that was uh, got from the routers was stored separately. And of course you can see that the red line, a very linear you know, growth, so 50, me 50 megabyte per peer. So don't know, you have uh, you know, 100 peers and then you calculate how, how much uh, memory you need in that sense. Uh, but then, uh, of course, uh, that was not scaling, scaling very well. Getting past also the 100 or 150 peers, of course, it was posing uh, an issue, like you need a lot of memory. And, um, and so what happened is that uh, I come up with uh, a different uh, sort of algorithm, but which essentially, and that's the one, the blue line that you see at the bottom, that essentially starts converging on the 17, 17 18 megs per uh, peer. And essentially, uh, it uh, uh, just uh, has one BGP table with all the seeing prefixes, let's say, from all the BGP peers. And then, of course, there is a sort of layer of virtualization, so there is some metadata saying from which peer I'd seen that prefix. So there is this sort of two-step algorithm. And so what you can see, the result of that, is that for 500 P routers, then you have a consumption of roughly 9 gig of memory. Of course, how this is calculated, you can see at the top of, the, of this uh, illustration, which is with uh, half a million IPv4 routes, 50K IPv6 routes, and uh, a 64-bit executable. So, uh, moving to the back end, um, I would say that the main idea uh, behind the PMSCCT over the time was that, um, you know, you need some sort of uh, aggregation because of writing every microflow to the disk, it's uh, something not scalable, right? So, yeah, you can still do that because uh, uh, disks maybe uh, are very cheap and things like that, but then when you need to build a report, then that's where it will hit. And uh, so, uh, why doing then uh, the, the aggregation, uh, you know, uh, later on? You do it uh, right away, and uh, that really drives to a project-driven approach to NetFlow. So just, uh, which is a little bit something which is not done in a lot of companies. So in a lot of uh, organizations, what I verify uh, is that uh, NetFlow, why you are collecting NetFlow, yeah, I'm doing that just for the sake of, right? One day it will be useful for something, so storing everything. Uh, but I think that's a little bit wrong. If you do not need NetFlow, then uh, yeah, you should not collect it. And if you need it, then you have a very clear ideas on what you want to do. And if that's the case, then you can take a more project-oriented approach to NetFlow and so start aggregating data up front and not just let it go on your disks forever and then uh, you never know if you can count on that data, yes or no. So the Microflow approach is okay, but it's good for, uh, you know, development, network development, for lab and things like that. But for a production network for operators that really are seeking for information out of it, I mean, I'm, I don't see much sense in doing that. But, of course, if anybody disagrees with that, we can have discussion later on or whatever. So, what you can do, for example, in PMSCCT is... Uh, as I said, uh, uh, temporal and uh, spatial aggregation. So, for example, you can define and aggregate with the number of primitives that you, uh, you see over there, peer source IP, peer destination IP, peer and uh, whatever, and then do uh, SQL history five minutes. So essentially, you not only are saying that I want just a subset of the primitives from the routing plane or from the telemetry plane, let's say, but you can also be build it in a time bins. So five minutes, 10 minutes, one hour, whatever. Uh, that will build a, a, a data tuple, a tuple like the one that you see uh, over there defined in uh, SQL. Uh, 
And at the very end, you can do also some temporal grouping. So if you see at the clock over there, you can create SQL tables per hour, for example. So what you have is uh, some aggregated uh, data on the spatial side and aggregated data on the temporal side, and then you can still group it by hour or by day or by whatever you want. Um, still on the scalability, so as you can do uh, some temporal grouping, you can do also spatial grouping. So you have your network and you chop up your networks into different SQL tables, right? So I, what I imagine over here is that, uh, for example, you have regions, so what I call it here, uh, cluster one, two, three, and four, and you assign that to different SQL tables, and uh, that can be also in addition to the temporal grouping. So it's not either or, but you can do it even both of them. What is the rash rational behind doing the grouping and the aggregation. The rationale is that uh, SQL is a very beautiful uh, language, but uh, so very powerful. Uh, you can get a lot of information uh, with it. It's uh, standardized, so you can get also people in your organization which is just out of the university, they will know about SQL, so it's not something new for them, it's not something, uh, uh, you know, proprietary. Uh, but the downside of relational databases is that if tables then become very, very big, then, uh, you know, they are not manageable anymore unless you have uh, plenty of resources. So in order to plan uh, the resources better, it's, uh, you know, it's uh, what I'm presenting is a number of divide et impera approaches by which essentially you can, uh, you know, really um, uh, divide the data as you prefer to keep uh, the SQL table very small and manageable. And still on scalability, I mean, a single collector um, might not fit it all, like a single PC running PMSSD can, might not fit it all because, don't know, for example, uh, yeah, uh, you have memory issue or CPU issue and things like, um, things like that. So once again, the DVD et impera approach is very valid. So what you can do is really to assign routers to collectors, and then you can assign collectors to databases, or you can also cluster the databases. That's really up to you. So also matrices can get uh, rather big. So can we do anything about it? Uh, my take is that yes, so we can. So uh, first of all is that uh, we can keep smaller routers out of the equation. So what I see is that a lot of organizations, they are uh, interested into, uh, you know, the most, uh, the, the top flows or very high, or high speed customers. So one gig interfaces, 10 gig interfaces, 100 gig interfaces, and things like that. Of course, there is still plenty of legacy around, so uh, serial interfaces, Cisco 7200, Cisco 10K, uh, just to, do, uh, to make some examples. So in my opinion, those small routers can be kept out of the equation. You don't really need an overview onto the small flows or the routers that can't really contribute something which is painful for your backbone. And, of course, because nowadays it's very uh, common to use also modular chassis, so uh, Juniper MX or, don't know, Cisco 7600, ASR, and things like that, um, then, of course, uh, you start getting also the low-speed uh, serial customers also on these other platforms. So, doing the same algorithm as before, I mean, you can just uh, not include those interfaces into, you know, uh, the equation. So, do not enable the export on those interfaces. Um, then uh, the other advice maybe is uh, to uh, focus on the relevant traffic direction. So, for example, upstream if uh, you are a CDN or downstream if you are a service provider. Uh, so that's what uh, in uh, linear algebra they would call the triangular matrix. So essentially you just uh, instead of focusing on the full square, you just uh, focus on a direction or on the half uh, matrix that you really uh, think it's useful to yourself. Of course, there is uh, still some players out there, like uh, IP carriers or people that tend to put, uh, you know, uh, both CDN and the eyeballs on the same network that, of course, yeah, they still need the full matrix, and uh, that's it. And, of course, the, the last advice is to increase the sampling rate, right? Um, 
this is something I will not comment a lot, SQL. I don't want to come at now and comment on SQL. Uh, but uh, uh, let's say um, uh, this is uh, just for who is more or less familiar with SQL to see how at the very end uh, a query uh, to get the traffic out of the you know, database would look like, right? So um, I think it's very logical and uh, you know, it's just for your reference for the future. And because, let's say, Time is never enough, and I had to skim a, a, through a, a number of topics which are very interesting, uh, which are, for example, the auto-discovery and automation, because as Arman also was saying, I mean, without auto-discovery and automation, you don't go anywhere. Um, so, uh, and also the entities on the provider IP address space, because we spoke a lot about BGP, but you also lend a lot of your IP addresses to your customers, for example, so what can you do in that case? And then, uh, you know, other, other stuff, together with uh, some uh, presentation about uh, the specific case of peering and some quick start guides and whatever. So I would like to leave you with all of these references uh, that are publicly available and uh, you know, um, make your way through them and if there is any questions, uh, you know, you pay me a beer and we are friends. So thanks very much. And any question now? Good, thanks. All right, well, Paolo is too modest uh, to compare uh, PMA CCT with any um, other uh, tools, but I will do that for him. Uh, you know, in the last 10 years we've been working on this, uh, in this area, uh, PMA CCT has really stood out in terms of uh, being the most scalable, uh, usable, and affordable uh, way to go. It's very difficult, we found, to do um, to have any uh, of the existing systems, especially the commercial ones, um, where you can enable it on all of your edge routers at any reasonable uh, cost and also at any reasonable maintainability. You know, Paolo is, is concerned that it all doesn't fit on one uh, collector, right? But imagine if your collection was limited, you know, five routers to one collector. The, the amount of uh, hassle and scale of requiring to maintain that is considerably larger. And uh, of course, the price is right. It's just a beer. So, and you know, again, we're working um, with Paolo for a lot of the integration to just make a lot of the discovery and um, just make it less and less uh, uh, hassle to get the information out and pass it to the planning component. Okay, we're actually doing well on time. Uh, to the third portion. Um, of, of this talk. As a reminder, uh, we're talking about uh, planning. As I said before, uh, planning is really one part of a comprehensive traffic management. Uh, decisions one, make, uh, one makes on how much capacity to put in place, um, how to control routing, uh, uh, strategically over, you know, to, to configure uh, routing primary and secondary versus operationally being able to notice congestion and just move traffic around. All of those really go hand in hand um, uh, as, as part of a single system. Um, what I'm going to be really concentrating here is that top portion um, that's what you can see with the oval and talking a little bit about how uh, the practice of, with the practice of planning, one can get out of some common and, and uh, wasteful uh, topologies. So specifically, uh, building core topologies that are built in ladder shape or ring shape are just wasteful. Um, because for each of those things, you're setting aside a whole unit of capacity as backup for every unit that are using, you're using for your primary. It can be expensive. Um, furthermore, with the rings and the other ones, it's just a hassle because again, if you have to, you, you have to maintain uh, similar um, capacities across the whole network and you know, cost-wise, it's, it's quite big. So here's, there's a comparison between one-to-one -one saving versus uh, two-to-one uh, protection. And the idea is that if you can configure your network in the ladder, for example, where one of, imagine just only one of the links is being used to carry the primary. When that fails, 
if it's being if the um, uh, the other two links can be used as backup that rather implies that the first link could go up to 66 percent utilization without each link could go up to 66 without uh, um, uh, without causing congestion under failure modes and it's a lot of it's a big difference right if you if for every hundred million dollars it's nice to be able to sell say 15 to 20 million in practice you know supposedly you should be saving more but you know it's it's that 15 to 20 percent is is quite useful similarly if you want to get out of uh, a ring topology and be adding express links here and there 10 to 20 percent savings are common uh, but again nothing is free once you go out of a simple ring or a ladder you have to pay for it in terms of beefing up your planning processes okay and just jump directly to that. So as soon as you're out of the ladder or the ring, link statistics are not enough. Right? You need to be able to look at your, the failure modes of your network. And that's where your planning folks need to understand your topologies. They need to understand what sort of uh, routing is possible, what affects it. And similarly, the operations folk need to be able to know, hey, well, how do I move things around if I really must? And those lines get blurred. I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on this uh, uh, just to make sure that we are able to finish up in about 20 minutes. Um, but again, the, the idea is to be able to uh, take the traffic matrix uh, from before, uh, scale it up as, need, as appropriate, um, be able to do the simulation analysis and have the uh, the utilization thresholds be looked at under worst case traffic okay? so that's the what if analysis that says hey look if under failure I'm still less than you know the magic 80 percent with the anticipated growth I'm fine I'm done okay? secondly if you find yourself you're not done that you're not being there, you, it is entirely worthwhile to be looking at uh, modifying the topology. If there's a large amount of traffic going from Chicago to Washington, there's really no reason to, for it to be going through Detroit. Why not just add a, a, a direct link in there? And that both to improve the protection and uh, to cut some um, uh, port costs. And uh, last but not least, the idea of being able to separate the traffic so that your um, right, so that you're you're making uh, per service source of planning becomes again very powerful, because what it means is that if you have some traffic which you absolutely don't mind uh, being dropped every now and then, you know, under big failure at peak time. Uh, you could conceivably, and there are people who've known to do that, say, look, my uh, acceptable utilization limit is uh, 125%, 130%. That's okay. You know, they're, they're paying me $3 a megabit. It's okay. <laughs> and that, that's, again, drives the cost quite a bit. Now, the counterpart to changing the capacity and changing the topology of the network is to be able to do some uh, network optimization to make the best use of the capacity that is already there. Okay. Uh, again, Clarence's nice quote is, uh, network engineering is the process of manipulating your network to suit your traffic um, versus traffic engineering, which we're moving to now, which is manipulating your traffic to suit your network. We're finding that uh, there is uh, a desire to be able to do traffic engineering, but a definite fear uh, in terms of the complexities involved. And so because of that, um, um, most of the slides on this have to do with alternatives to, um, uh, to what uh, has been touted as traffic engineering for the last uh, um, 10 years, uh, which is RSVPT or MPLST. And the questions that uh, uh, Clarence wants everybody to be able to ask themselves is, you know, which approach am I going to use, IGP or, or MPLS? Am I going to be doing this uh, strategically? Am I going to be laying out 
um, a whole routing for normal and failure conditions or just tactically let things get congested as need be um, as it happens and be able to uh, mitigate that congestion afterwards. Um, I'll jump over the questions and uh, go directly to, to the fish, which I'm sure everybody is sick of seeing. Has anyone not seen this picture? Or has, has everyone seen this picture, I assume, over time? Um, again, it's the, the classic picture that says you want to get some traffic from the left-hand side to the right-hand side. The shortest path is across the northern path. And um, you find yourself getting congested. Um, you do want to utilize the, uh, the southern route, but how do you do it? And, you know, 10 years ago, people would see this picture and they would say, well, you, you, you can change some of the IGP metrics. Then all the traffic switches over and, you know, mayhem strikes, so let's make sure to put in tunnels and then you can uh, peel off the traffic, you know, uh, piece by piece, so to say. Okay. Uh, and again here, the, the main thing I want to emphasize is the, the fact that uh, people do, even in the year 2011, still continue to manipulate their IGP metrics as a way of traffic engineering. It is, in my experience, still the most common way. It has its place. Um, yes, there's, it is possible to be shifting traffic if you're doing it blindly. Uh, to be shifting traffic a lot, uh, but a lot of the time most folks are using uh, uh, creating equal cost paths, and you know things just don't do, don't go crazy. Okay, I mean there are limitations for um, traffic engineering itself, and there are limitations on traffic engineering using the IGP. And again, keep in mind traffic engineering is not going to create capacity. If you have a bottleneck, you have a bottleneck. If your policy is to be resilient um, to single failures and you have a router with just two uplinks, you must add capacity at that point, at some point. But in the cases that uh, you do have the room, oh, sorry, this is um, the slide I was just talking to you about with changing the metrics in order to, to create uh, equal cost. Um, with lots of references in between. Uh, again, in, I'm going to walk you through uh, an example of a network. Uh, it's not a made-up network. It was a, a, um, existing uh, uh, data, real data, uh, to get a sense for how uh, just manipulating metrics can bring down uh, utilizations quite a bit. Um, in this case, uh, again, this is the U.S. The northern routes are tend to be faster. In this case, you had a lot of traffic. Uh, going from peering points in Chicago to eyeballs uh, on the East Coast, and a lot of them going across the top path under normal, or um, if the uh, link between Chicago and Detroit up here were to fail, a lot of the traffic shifting to this southern middle route. Okay. Uh, there is, again, no reason to be completely afraid of this. There are, uh, established procedures, tools in place um, that allow okay, um, that allow one to uh, uh, change the metrics such that where you start with lots of congestion under worst case traffic before, you can get yourself uh, a huge way off you know, from 120% normal utilization to 72 or bringing it down by um, uh, almost a factor of third under failure. These are not crazy numbers. This is uh, what takes place normally. So if you want to do T, if you do want to get out of the one-to-one uh, -one protection, these are, this is quite possible. It's done on a day-to-day -day basis. And you do not have to uh, make an investment uh, in, in RSVP if you don't want to. Um, this is a bit old from 2002, but um, we, we looked at uh, uh, a set of real networks comparing the different procedures, um, uh, manipulating metrics, uh, sorry, not doing anything, just leaving the metrics as they are, manipulating the metrics versus manipulating RSVP paths. And we're finding that um, if your objective is to be bringing down maximum utilization, 
Um, of course, not doing anything. Sorry, this is... Um, that's right. Not doing anything, which is... Um, that say the red is the uh, display-based metrics, the, just delay-based metrics. Um, you're, you're quite a bit far off from the optimal. But often the green, which is um, uh, the optimized metrics, are quite good. It's not as good as explicitly manipulating your RSVP traffic. Um, Right? In, in some cases, like here, you know, it's 9,200% off. But a lot of people find that trade-off to be worthwhile. Um, that it's, it's uh, you, you pay a 10% trade-off, but you save yourself a huge amount of hassle and changing, changing procedures. Um, I have examples of that. Let me just jump to it here. So this was presented at uh, one of the Nanogs um, in Las Vegas, I believe, where, again, this comparison was being made. And uh, they could see that introducing tunnels would decrease the worst case failure utilization. That's this axis here. And would decrease it under normal. It was a bit lower. But manipulating the metrics, even though it was a bit higher, was, was good enough. So let's not, choose, let's not uh, uh, add to the complexity of the network if we don't need to. Now, again, this is not for everybody. Um, if you're in a situation where your network traffic changes a huge amount, is extremely dynamic, as is the case for some of the more enterprise-like networks, where it's not a huge aggregation of individual customers that, that you're dealing with, in those cases, uh, using dynamic tunnels is actually uh, quite appropriate and maybe, maybe the only way to go. For those cases, um, tunnel sizing is really key. How do you keep the tunnel bandwidth in sync with the actual traffic that's going in it? And I highly recommend anybody who's thinking about introducing that to do an analysis of their um, uh, tunnel bandwidth setting procedure against the traffic profile that they see. Um, what we've found uh, consistently is that if you use auto bandwidth with the straight procedures as, as they come out of the box, um, you'll find yourself that you're either often behind or ahead of the traffic curve. So you can see here, these are the, the, the bandwidth lag. You can see that you're setting it <coughs> Uh, too high and you're catching up to making it lower over time but the traffic has already changed and is increasing. At each of these places, if, if you're here, you get, you're in a position where your network um, is potentially rejecting tunnels needlessly. And at these points here, you're risking congestion for absolutely no reason at all because there's, your tunnels believe a uh, certain amount of bands going through them, but in actuality there's more. So really for dynamic, for dynamic MPLS, the key is to make sure that the tunnel sizing is done, is done well. We're finding that it's a relatively small number of people who are using um, auto bandwidth, and they've uh, really had to tweak it to get it right. Um, offline sizing seems to be uh, more prevalent, where you know, relatively periodically, it's an external procedure that looks at all the, um, the data and makes it, uh, sees, already sees ahead and sets the, um, uh, sets the tunnel based on what is expected to be coming in the next four hours or the next 24 hours. And that gives one a lot more stable network and uh, you, uh, bypass the need for having, uh, uh, off, having readjustments. Um, that take place often and can be running ahead or behind. Okay. So this example here, um, it's one for, it's, we have only about 15 minutes left. Um, I will jump over uh, a lot of the T discussions. I think 
in the past uh, few years, we have had many discussions on this topic. I highly recommend uh, um, any of the uh, presentations my colleague Thomas Telkamp has given on this topic. Is, um, uh, those cover the choice between where to put the mesh, um, how to make sure that the, your own routers are not sending traffic to different tunnels um, uh, under failure, that if, if an edge router is sending traffic to a particular core router, that it continues to do that instead of sloshing the traffic around elsewhere under failure. Um, and he has a good case study um, uh, on the use of dynamic MPLC f at, uh, from Global Crossing 2004. <coughs> so I will skip over those. Okay, but just jump to the conclusion basically. Metric T is viable, um, it does have its limitations. If you're going to use, uh, if you need uh, dynamic MPLS tunnels, make sure that sizing, tunnel sizing issues are taken care of and traffic sloshing is taken in place. Explicit tunnels are in use, especially amongst uh, folks who are transitioning from ATM, um, but it takes a lot of overhead. Okay. Any questions on this topic before going on? Uh, before we move to the next section, who has uh, heard of uh, loop-free alternates or IP fast reroutes? Wow. <laughs> it's much fewer than I thought. Okay. Um, so again, in, in 2001, uh, a lot of the discussions was about fast reroutes. You know, you have a failure in your network. Let's put in fast reroute tunnels that will very quickly um, transition traffic from a link to an alternate path that bypasses that link. And a lot of the discussion was how do you, how do you set up these uh, alternate paths and whatnot. Uh, again, given the issues and complexities of maintaining um, all the various uh, fast route ones, there's been an, a, a desire uh, to have the routers just figure out an alternate by themselves and send things along the alternate path. In this case, if you look at the source of the traffic being S um, and the destination being D1, if the um, normal uh, best path is uh, through router F, what the routers uh, do with uh, loop-free alternates is to look at every neighbor, every other neighbor, other than the one whose failure you're looking at, and see if S were to send its, whoops, if S were to send its traffic to C, would C just send it back to S for the destination D1? Or would C forward to someplace else that would go on? Uh, similar, similar question for E. So the router by itself, without needing to communicate with anybody else, creates a, an alternate table. For each prefix, in addition to the best path, it creates a list of alternates. Alternates that it believes do not send the traffic back to it. And then it looks at, well, which which of the alternates do I send it on? Of course, prefer primary over secondary. If uh, one of the backup path has the lowest metric, send it that one. You know, presumably that's the least delay um, um, penalty. Line card disjointness, node disjointness, plus a bunch of options to uh, fine tune things, which he doesn't recommend you use after all. But you know, you never know; it becomes handy. Um, the benefits are it's simple. You know, doesn't require any IETF changes. You don't have to worry about interoperability. If it works, it just works. Okay. And that's, that's, that's beautiful. You know, less than 50 milliseconds, no tunnels, no maintenance. It's a little bit harder to plan. Again, that's, uh, uh, that's why I'm here, I guess. Um, but in terms of uh, uh, hassles, it's, it's very low on that part. Okay. The main constraints on it are that it's topology dependent. You know, if, if you have a ring and you're sitting at the top of the ring and want to be sending something to uh, a node that's at 3 o'clock, 
if this link uh, between 12 and 1 o'clock fails, you, if you send it to the one that's at 11 o'clock, it is just going to be sending it back to you. Right? So for a lot of topologies, there are no loop-free alternates available. So you know, it's definitely not a panacea. The beauty of it is that for a lot of preset edge topologies, you can work out the metrics such that you're guaranteed loop-free alternates. Okay? And so uh, uh, Clarence has put together this slide as a way of uh, a decision tree for saying when loop-free alternate is, is, a, is, is viable. Uh, along the top branch, if your target convergence is to be less than one second, um, you can have, uh, you can set your, uh, 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 you can tune your timers and all uh, to be able to have IGP fast convergence, and there are lots and lots of uh, uh, how-tos on that. And then you can put in this loop-free alternates as a bonus. If you're targeting less than 50 milliseconds, then, and you're on the edge, it's this, that's the sweet spot. It's, it's, uh, there are well-established guidelines. You can follow them and get loop-free alternates in place. For the backbone, um, you need to do some analysis to see when loop-free alternates are, are applicable. And in the cases that are not, and only in those cases do you need to bother with something uh, heavier like uh, TE fast reroute. And they have done some, some studies on it, um, which I, I cannot claim to be able to describe well, um, but that uh, the five topologies were well protected above 95% of the actual traffic was well protected on those. Uh, and like I said before, there's a ton of edge, edge uh, topologies, common edge topologies, where they have worked out the metrics, so you can just turn it on. And a, another link to uh, some studies on IP fast reroute. Okay. And as I said at the beginning, we're going to skip this part. Let me just walk you through three minutes for an example of the design um, exercise, a, design, a full design exercise in three minutes. Okay? This is a, a fictional example based on a, a, a real case. Uh, mobile back, backbone with six uh, already defined uh, core, core sites predefined and uh, many, many uh, uh, feeder sites, only three of which are shown here, KL, Cologne, and Bonn. And the, again, the objective was to have a cost-effective low delay solution and um, that meets the projected traffic matrix. The optical design rules here were similar to, to many folks, is that the core links should go over the shortest, uh, shortest delay, that the primary core link should go over the shortest delay. Uh, and it should be diverse, right? You don't want to have a single optical failure bring down multiple core links. For the remote PEs, they would be homed into the closest PE first, and secondarily into the next closest PE as long as it's diverse. Okay? And then the IP design rules were, as you can see here, two PE routers in each site, two PEs uh, in each site, and a bunch of edge routers where the traffic is... Uh, actually being sourced, being brought into the network from the media gateways, okay? So these are relatively cheap and they're being used as aggregation devices. The optical network itself, um, again, I've been told this is uh, pretty realistic uh, for, for the German, uh, for German optical network. It's a little bit dif difficult to see the geographic layout, so there's a schematic layout presented here, okay? Uh, lots of rings, nothing terribly unusual. What's interesting is that if you were to route these core links that are displayed here over the optical in the shortest delay possible, you will get yourself optical segments that house multiple core links, right? One here, between Frankfurt and Cologne, and another one between Frankfurt and Darmstadt. And what that means is that a single 
optical failure, single, uh, um, uh, a single SRLG, a single thing, could bring down two of the major core links, which is undesirable. So it's not so bad. What you can do is instead of routing Dusseldorf to Frankfurt over this shortest path, you can go slightly longer through Kassel and Erfurt. And similarly for Cologne to Stuttgart, remember it was going through Darmstadt. Now have it go through Bonn, Wiesbaden, Mainz, and then to Stuttgart. And you have yourself nice diverse paths. Okay. Relatively quick. So you get yourself an initial topology built. That's two minutes for the core. Then for the PEs, some of them is easy for the remote nodes. Something like Kiel, um, the closest is Hamburg, second closest is Dusseldorf, they're diverse, you're done. For Bonn, it's a little bit more difficult because the closest uh, PE is Dusseldorf, right here, but second closest is Frankfurt, and that's why Bonn is here. And that would not be diverse. You see, this would be a common failure here. Right? So you look at the next uh, closest, and that's Stuttgart. So that becomes where it gets homed into. And okay, right now within three minutes, you have yourself a design. You have the traffic matrix. You have the design. Um, you can do the simulation analysis and size the links initially, such that uh, they're green under normal and less than you know that magic 80, 85 percent under failure. Okay, so you're. You're done with your capacity planning portion. Um, you can use, uh, uh, you know, one of the made add-ons or uh, once the, many of these exist to look at how much LFA coverage you have. And you notice that indeed in the in the core, uh, there's a lot of places where you do not have LFA coverage, but in the edge you do. Um, and you can do a little bit of metric optimization insofar as if you do create ECMP paths in the core, that also brings up your loop-free alternate coverage, right? ECMP is the poor man's uh, uh, LFA, after all. And there you have it. It took four minutes, but you have a, a, a full network design and capacity analysis in about four minutes. Okay. So I will conclude. Uh, I, We've tried to make a case for how capacity planning and describing how it's essential for ensuring SLAs. Okay? If you want to have SLAs within reasonable cost, it is worth, worthwhile to put in a more robust capacity planning process. The router vendors have their parts in making sure that the infrastructure is there to provide the information. Um, planning tools like us work to automate the discovery, the traffic matrix, doing the simulation and optimization. But one of the things I've really tried to point out here is that it is so much easier to stick to what you have than to try to change anything in a service provider network. It is difficult, and I'm very sympathetic for that. For these sorts of changes to take place for any company or any network, uh, infrastructure provider to go beyond Excel and what's easy to move into something that is um, uh, that gives you that 15 to 20 percent savings that is more flexible. It is going to take effort, and ultimately, it's it's you guys that have to put together um, the vision for the management that this is something we do want to do, and it takes time and effort to put put those things through. And I encourage you to do that. <laughs> All right, I think we're done. We even have a few minutes for questions or, or comments. It's okay, it's okay. <laughs> Okay, if there are no questions, comments, we can be done uh, 50 seconds early. Thank you very, very much.